started, and I'll turn that over to uh, Brian Seit for our talk today. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, looking forward to the discussion today. So welcome, everybody. Uh, today we are uh, having a webcast on uh, preparing TMDL plans for Pennsylvania MS4 communities. Um, my name is Brian Seip. I'm a watershed manager here at the Center for Watershed Protection. Uh, also with us today is Lee Epstein with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I want to really thank the Bay Foundation for uh, pulling this webcast together for us and also helping with some of the work in, that we've been doing up in Pennsylvania. I uh, really have been a big supporter of, of um, working with the jurisdictions up there and um, I think Lee will share a little bit more information about, about uh, CBF and their activities here shortly. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I think maybe it looks like a few other participants are kind of uh, coming on uh, board, but uh, we'll at least get in here and, and start covering some, some housekeeping items. Uh, as you can see here, we are using Adobe Connect as our webcast interface. Uh, if you're not familiar with Adobe Connect, it's a pretty straightforward program. Uh, you can change how the slides are presented or seen on your screen under the meeting tab. You can go to full screen if you prefer to see it that way. Uh, we are using the, um, the question Q&A box, uh, the chat box you see there on the, on the right corner of the screen uh, to, um, to ask questions and provide comment. So please type in any questions you have there. I'm hoping we'll have time at the end of the webcast to go through your questions. I can't guarantee you I can answer all of your questions. I will certainly do my best. Uh, but uh, if, if it's something that we can help out with, uh, we can certainly follow up with you afterwards or direct you potentially to, the, to somebody who can answer your question. But I'll do my best to answer your questions, although I'm sure I will not have all the answers uh, for you. So we're going to go ahead and, and jump right in here. Uh, so again, I want to thank the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for, uh, for helping to put this webcast on and, uh, and again for all the work that they've been supporting up in Pennsylvania. Uh, so Lee, uh, perhaps you could uh, share a little bit of information about the Bay Foundation and, and what you guys are up to. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Good. Um, well, uh, thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks for your good work. Um, for those of you who don't know who we are, this slide explains a bit who we are, but I'm, I'm not going to go through that. Um, I just want to say very briefly that we're very happy to have uh, sponsored this uh, project where we're trying to help local governments deal with some pretty difficult issues. And, um, and we're very happy with our partnership with uh, the center um, on this effort. Um, what we have seen, what we see this to be as an opportunity to fill in some knowledge and, and process gaps um, for how municipalities in Pennsylvania which have MS4 permits can address some of their planning needs under those permits. Um, through this project, actually, C CWP has worked closely with almost 50 municipalities in, um, in two counties in Pennsylvania. And, um, and we hope their experience that's shared here today can assist um, others, not just those in those two counties, but many, more, many, many more in the Commonwealth. Um, so I, I really have nothing else to say in, in introduction, and I, I just uh, will hand it back to Brian, and uh, I, I think this is going to be a good uh, presentation. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Lee, and again, thank you for uh, the sponsorship and all the great work you guys are, are doing, both in Pennsylvania and, and in the watershed at, at large. So I'm going to go ahead and keep, keep moving on here. Um, just as a quick introduction, if, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with the Center for Watershed Protection, we are a nonprofit. Uh, our main headquarters offices are, are in Ellicott City, Maryland, but we have staff in New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, so we're kind of scattered about, and, and many of us spend a lot of time in our cars uh, driving uh, to the far reaches of the watershed. We, we are a national organization, so we also do work um, 
you know, in all kinds of parts of the country, west coast, uh, down south, um, uh, you know, all kinds of different places. Even we've done some work out in the uh, uh, in some of the islands. So uh, we offer, um, you know, basically guidance uh, documents. We have technical uh, experts that can provide uh, hands-on technical assistance, and we do a lot of trainings, kind of like these webcasts that you're listening to today. We have national webcasts that cover a wide variety of topics, and uh, my favorite thing is, you know, getting involved uh, individually with, with jurisdictions and trying to figure out uh, all the, the issues and how we can how we can deal with them. So if you're interested in learning more about us, uh, our website's uh, cwp.org and uh, encourage you to jump on there and check out. We've got a lot of great resources for you to uh, take a look at. Also wanted to let you know that uh, the webcast uh, today, if you didn't hear before, is being recorded. I'll also be uh, pulling together some resources and uh, the webcast uh, landing page on the Bay Foundation and we'll probably provide some sort of link on our page as well. You can, uh, you can go there and download uh, the recording and the presentation so you can listen back to it. So don't worry too much about detailed notes, although you're welcome to take detailed notes, uh, but you can listen back to the presentation at a later date or, as Chris said earlier, uh, share it with some of your colleagues if they're not able to attend today. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right on into the topic today and, and give you a quick overview. So what I'm going to cover is some key definitions. Uh, look at what the TMDL plan, the plan requirements for TMDL plan are. Um, what we did to get started, um, looking at evaluating the TMDL document itself and comparing it to maybe what information you have. We'll go step by step through the TMDL design criteria, uh, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So again, feel free to type in your questions in the chat box at any time, and at the end we'll scroll back through and I'll try to answer as many as I can. Uh, again, I can't promise I can answer every question, but I will certainly do my best. So again, just jumping into the background here, just wanted to provide some definitions. So the first one is, you know, what is a TMDL? Well, here's you, EPA's definition. A TMDL is a calculation of the maximum amount of a pollutant that a water body can receive, receive and still meet water quality standards and an allocation of that load among the various sources of that pollutant. So pollutant sources are characterized as either point sources that receive a waste load allocation, a WLA, uh, or non-point sources that receive a load allocation. So what is a waste load allocation? Well, waste load allocation is the amount of pollutant from existing point sources. That would be sewage treatment plants, industrial facilities, and stormwater. As we all know, stormwater is, is kind of a unique one, but it is definitely characterized as a point source. So we fall firmly in the MS4 category in stormwater right, right there in the waste load allocation. Uh, category, and then there's load allocations, which is the amount of pollutant from existing non-point sources and natural background sources. So this would be run farm runoff, atmospheric deposition, those types of things. So, and then included in that also is a margin of safety, which is part of the TMDL, which is allocated to uncertainty in the analysis. So that that's sort of what makes up the primary components of a TMDL. You can kind of see that. Waste load allocation is really sort of targeted to those folks that have permits and are regula regulated, and load allocations you know, pretty much are, are non-regulated sources. So really, um, the, 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 the effort really needs to be focused on coming up with strategies for the waste load allocation in this document, and then hopefully through voluntary and other, uh, other activities, we can also get at the load allocation. Uh, and I just wanted to provide this quick little definition at the bottom, which my uh, friends at DEP sort of always sort of point me towards, which is the, the MS4 is responsible for the quantity and quality of the water that drains into the MS4. So you've got to remember that it, it could be that other areas that you're not necessarily thinking about, which are actually discharging into your system and then discharging into a stream, are including included in your waste load allocation. So that's just a a point of reference, and we might come back to that um, here, and, here and there, but it, it may help when you look at some of your TMDLs, understanding why certain land uses are included in, in your TMDL. It may be because uh, they are draining into your MS4. So what are the plan requirements? And this is basically what we're going to go through step by step. Well, this is outlined in uh, PADEP's 
municipal separate, uh, separate stormwater system, TMDL, Chesapeake Bay Pollution Reduction Plan requirements. Here's the long number uh, and, and document reference. Uh, I'm sure you can easily Google search this and, and find it. Uh, but there's, uh, today we're focusing on Section A. Section B, which is the Chesapeake Bay Pollution Reduction Plan, will be covered in a webcast uh, next week, and I'll get to that uh, at the end. But today we're focusing uh, primarily on that first component, which is uh, those MS4s that have local TMDLs and need to address the local TMDL as well as the Chesapeake Bay Pollution Reduction Plan. So uh, the first part of that is the summary of the TMDL strategy that was in your permit application or your NOI. The second part is identifying surface waters that receive stormwater discharges from the MS4 urbanized area. Uh, you need to identify discharge points from the MS4. You need to list the applicable TMDL or TMDLs. Uh, you need to provide the eight-digit HUC code. You need to list all the municipalities subject to the TMDL. And you need to list pollutants and the waste load allocation. Uh, estimate the current loads and percent reduction required. Explain how your loads were determined and list the control measures. So we're going to basically go step by step through these um, and, and cover uh, some information related to these. Many TMDLs were, were written and a lot are very different. So we're sort of drawing on some of our experience um, in the communities that Lee described earlier. Uh, your TMDL may be quite different and uh, you know certainly uh, I think some of these, in particular for sediment and, and, and the nutrients, I think were pretty applicable. There may be others, uh, bacteria or metals, that may be a little bit different, but hopefully I'll touch on a few things here and uh, potentially it's something we can touch base on later if you have additional questions. So to get started, um, when you first sort of try to tackle what are you going to do for this TMDL plan? The first thing you need is the TMDL document, and we'll get to that in a minute as well. And then what was really helpful for us here as we uh, got going was pulling together relevant GIS data uh, to really help check out the TMDL and, and allow us to do things like calculate current loads and, and uh, loading rates and all those kinds of wonderful things. So uh, the, some of the key uh, layers that we uh, used, although this is certainly not a complete list, more is always better, but your watershed boundaries, your streams, the impaired watershed boundary, the impaired streams, uh, impervious surfaces, the urbanized area boundary, the municipal boundary, topo lines, roads, public lands, and storm sewers are a good start. So hopefully you can uh, get that kind of information at a minimum. If you've got other data, that, that's, that's great, and certainly encourage you to pull together as much as you can. But at a minimum, this, this is really going to help you really determine what you need to do, where you need to do it, what your current loads are, and what kind of load reduction estimates you can come up with. So I, I really encourage you to try to get a hold of these, this, these data layers if you can. Also, if they're available, if your jurisdiction is fortunate enough to, enough to have these, Watershed plans are fantastic resources, stream assessments, other studies that may have been done either by watershed groups, uh, maybe the municipal municipality itself or universities. Um, all those resources can be very, very helpful, especially when you're trying to identify projects um, or opportunities for, uh, for BMPs. These resources can really help sort of focus your your efforts to areas that, that may have already been identified and you, you don't have to start from scratch. But if you don't have these, never fear. You can, you can still do this work. It may be a little bit extra for you. There may be a little bit additional reconnaissance work involved. But, uh, but certainly if you have these, if they're available, uh, you go ahead and get those and, and take a close look at them. So what we did was to start things off was to really dig into that team. MDL document and really read it very carefully. I think what we ha what we saw was when some of the TMDLs were written, I don't think everybody was fully aware of what, what that meant and perhaps maybe some details were overlooked and definitely things have changed since then. So you really want to look at that TMDL document very carefully 
and, and pull out some, some information that's going to help you move forward. So the first thing is you're going to want to identify what's the waste load allocation. That's, that's the obviously a very key component because that's the load that you're going to be allotted and that you're going to need to get yourself the municipality down to that, that load allocation. So you need to know what that is. That's sort of the finish line. Um, how much area is in the impaired watershed? I'm going to get to that in a minute, but you really want to have a, a good solid impaired watershed boundary. It's going to be important for a number of things as we move forward, but you want to get a good handle on what that impaired watershed is. And then uh, along with that is how much of the urbanized area is in that impaired watershed. Also keep in mind if you have CSOs in your jurisdiction, you might want to check to see if they're in the impaired watershed as well and see how they're identified. And I'll, again, I'll touch on that in a minute. And then you, some TMDLs may be written a little bit differently, depends on how they were developed. But you might, you might want to look at the pollutant loading data, especially if it was based off maybe monitoring information, like stream discharge amounts, pollutant concentrations, pollutant loads, et cetera. Uh, especially the, those folks that are familiar with local conditions, you may be able to identify you know, where there might be some issues moving forward just by looking at some of those, those raw numbers um, and, and getting a feel for you know, what, what's a gut check for you in terms of how that, <clears throat> how that data really looks. And then you want to sort of start to compare that information to the, what data you have locally, what information you have. So the GIS information I just mentioned, if you have monitoring data, you might want to look at that any kind of land use change information that you might have available, uh, planning level documents, um, you might want to take a look at those as well, get an idea of what, uh, what information is available to you locally, which may be uh, more, uh, more specific and more uh, fine-tuned than, than some of the data that was used to develop the TMDL. And, and I'm, I'm not sure how long ago your TMDL was written, but it could be years and years ago. So some of the information may have been improved and some of the accuracy may have been improved as well and, and be reflected in your local data, but may not necessarily be reflected in, in the TMDL document. So once you sort of get that going, you're going to want to look really closely at how your local data compares to that TMDL data. And if you see some problems, you're going to want to contact DEP to determine what the issue is and, and which data source to use. So we ran into this issue, I'm going to cover this in a minute, but I, I can say you know, my experience with DEP was they were more than willing to work with us to solve the problems and, and come up with a solution to the issue. So, uh, so just to highlight where this is a problem, I wanted to show you this map. This is a, a map of the uh, Little Juniata watershed up in uh, Blair County, Pennsylvania. And the map on the left here, let me get my little arrow going. The map over on the left here is, um, is the map that was in the TMDL, here's my arrow, is in the TMDL document. So this, this map here is, this is a, basically a snapshot of what was in the TMDL document. This map over here reflects our GIS information. So, this blue boundary here is this boundary here, the, the TMDL document boundary here. The red boundary is the boundary that we had in GIS that said this was the impaired watershed. You can see they're different. And this is, this is a problem because this TMDL, as I believe many of them were, you can see down here we have an area that was included in the original TMDL that's not included in, in this. Uh, impaired watershed boundary, and you have this area here, which is not included. So these ones that were modeled, they model off of basically acres. So if these acres don't match up, it's going to be really difficult to calculate current loads and, and progress and things like that. So you, the easiest is if you can get these to match up. So what we found was this area here, and reflected here, was actually a, a CSO area. Uh, so that obviously is not MS4 and shouldn't be included. So we had that um, taken out, but this document also included another little stream up here that was also listed as impaired, so we had to include that in. So we worked with DEP to get this red line here as our new impaired watershed boundary, and we were able to go back and do some 
DEP was able to recalculate uh, some information for us, and then we were able to move forward with that, with that data in order to start to calculate current loads and load reductions and all that great stuff. So you can see right here, right out of the gate, we had a couple issues that we had to iron out. So again, it's just really important to really get into that document and make sure that there's just no major issues that are really going to create a lot of headaches for you later on. So that's step one, is really get in there and, and take a look at the details. The next step is, this, is getting into the design details. So we're going to go step by step through these. Most of them are pretty straightforward. In the end, there's a little bit more work. But the first couple steps are pretty easy. So the first thing you want to do is provide a summary of the TMDL strategy as submitted to DEP with your NPDES permit. Um, and you're going to summarize that and, and provide it to them. Here's an example. This is a summary from Blair County where they basically say, you know, we think we have some good opportunities uh, through changes in current land use and, and looking at stormwater BMPs and that they feel like the characteristics are favorable to reducing sediment in many cases. However, they need to do some uh, work to determine the most appropriate BMP where they should be installed and then obviously putting them into place. So they identify here that the development of a, that they need to really develop a restoration plan with site-specific information uh, regarding current land uses and existing conservation practices to come up with this. And this activity that we did really sort of helps to address this. If you have things like watershed plans and stream assessments, it can be even more helpful in identifying some opportunities. But uh, what you can see here, in the case of Blair, they, they sort of knew that they, they, had, they, they had some opportunities out there. They didn't know exactly what they were but that there were some, some chances and some opportunities to get in there and, and try to reduce loads. So um, essentially just you know, provide a summary of that. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, the next one also very straightforward is identify the names of surface water that receive stormwater discharges from the MS4 urbanized area that are covered by the EPA approved TMDL. So the best way to do this, if you can, and you have the GIS information and, and you have some good layers, is to, is to use that. You can identify all kinds of things, including uh, subwatersheds and tributaries and all kinds of things. So for instance, you know, for our work up in, in Blair, we're able to identify you know, all these other uh, sub, uh, tributaries that also drain to the impaired uh, watershed. But if you don't have GIS, uh, or you don't have it you know, ready to go, um, you can also use DEP's website. There's a link right here. You can jump on there, and it provides all the TMDLs, a uh, list of all the TMDLs that are, are out there. So for us, this is what we prepared. We prepared a, this sort of a, a basic map. I didn't want it to get too busy, but we kind of started with a map like this that you can see sort of a relief map. Uh, we have the streams on here. We have the municipal boundaries. We have the impaired watershed uh, boundaries, and uh, we have impaired waterways. If we were to click on some of these uh, streams, they would provide some additional information for us. Uh, so r really good. Um, for us, we were able to pull this together, and we can pull a lot of information out of, out of this. But if you don't have this, this is the website. This is just a snapshot view of the website I jumped on here. Uh, you can type in the TMDL name, you can type in the county, uh, you can type in the type of TMDL, and it'll search it. So in this case, we're working on the Little Juniata River watershed, and we type that and we hit go, and it kicks out this information down here, which it gives us, there's my arrow down here, it kicks us out some information about when it was approved, and then there's links to some of the documents. So I can go ahead and click right on here and get the TMDL document. There's also some public notice information, some other information you can get here. So you can go ahead and jump on here and you can get a lot of information out of this website if you don't have access to really good GIS data. But if you can get that GIS data, uh, you know, again, it really is important as we move forward, uh, but you can at least accomplish this portion with just a quick jump onto the Pennsylvania DEP website and a little bit of research and you can get the information you need. Next part is identifying the discharge points from your MS4. So the TMDL process really looks at the total stormwater uh, discharges from the municipality within a particular watershed, and it requires the municipality to take certain actions. 
Uh, so you need to know where your water is discharging. So first step is to identify the total number of discharges and provide an ID number for those discharge points, provide location information, uh, provide pipe information, and ideally provide a map. Uh, this can be really very helpful um, in the future, particularly if you really want to hone down on what the individual drainage areas are to each uh, outfall. But an easier way to do it is really just to look at, at your overall urbanized area. Doesn't excuse, still need to know where your discharge points are, but if you wanted to take it a step further, you could also do uh, drainage areas to each, each of these. And, and get even more specific, although that, that is definitely more involved than just looking at the urbanized area. So here's an example of what that would look like. You have your TMD, you have your MS4 outfall ID numbers here. You have some coordinates here, some lat long coordinates. You have the, what the pipe is, what kind of pipe it is, CMP, RCP, and then you have some pipe size information here. So you need to document where those pipes are. It's also helpful if you provide a map to go with it. Here's an example from Logan Township. You can see the outfalls, you know, where you'd expect them along the stream, uh, kind of following down through the valley. So a map with, with, the, uh, spread, with the documentation of those outfalls is important. Uh, you all should have, hopefully have that. If not, hopefully you're working on it. Uh, but it's important to get a handle on where those outfalls are and what their characteristics are. The next one is very simple, uh, the title of the TMDL. Uh, so again, if you don't have a TMDL handy, you can go to this uh, website, download the TMDL document, and take a look at it. So in this case, for our example purposes, we're talking about the Little Juniata River watershed in Blair County. This TMDL was dated December 2004. So add the document and the title. Uh, next is identifying the watershed uh, names and the eight-digit uh, HUC code or hydraulic code. This is uh, information is you can find it in a variety of places. It may be plainly stated in your TMDL document. Uh, so you may just be able to pull it right out of there. If not, you can jump on uh, TMDL, uh, or you can jump on this website here and uh, look up the HUC code from there. Here's a screenshot from that website, so you can see it. You can't see really well, but it just gives you an idea here. It's got the watershed name, it's got the, the HUC 8 code, and then the stream names that feed into, into, that, um, into that watershed. So if you don't have a GIS and all that, uh, you, can, you can still get this information out of, um, can I go back to the web address? Yeah, absolutely. Here's the web address. Just want to remind you all, the, the, this thing is being recorded and will be available, so you can, um, you can go back and, and, and uh, download the, webs, the webcast and, and re-listen back or even just zip through the slides. But uh, I'll leave this up for another second or two. Um, to take a look at it, and hopefully uh, you guys can jump on there. Okay, great, no problem. Moving on along. Next is design detail number six. Uh, you have to identify all the municipalities within the target watershed. Uh, if there are multiple municipalities in your watershed, you probably are going to need to do some level of cooperation in order to meet the waste load allocation. And this is because they may only provide one waste load allocation. Uh, so here's an example. This is what was in um, the TMDL document. It looks like we had a little bit of overlap on some of my bullet points, but I'll fill in there. Um, so you can see here, this is for this is for the little j. This is straight out of the document. Uh, again, just sort of use a snapshot to get to this. And you can see they provide a waste load allocation, but there's more than one jurisdiction in this watershed that are contributing uh, to the impairment. So, so who gets what share of this needs to be figured out. Um, and there's a couple of different ways you can do that, um, and it really is going to take some discussion uh, between those jurisdictions as to how you're going to divvy up that allocation. And again, the allocation is essentially your finish line. So you need, you need to get down, the watershed needs to get down 
to 2,036 tons per year in order to, of the waste load allocation. So they need to get down to this number to, to meet the load allocation. So there's a couple different ways you can do this. You could look at how much impervious area does each jurisdiction have, or what is the population, or how many impaired stream miles do they have, and use a percentage that way. What we used in, in Blair, and certainly what I recommend is potentially a starting point, and it's, it's covered up here, unfortunately, is, is just doing an equal uh, percent reduction. So essentially, you, uh, you figure out how much you need to get, and you apply the same percentage to all land uses. So it's essentially it's a fair deal. You know, everybody has to reduce 30% of the load from low-density residential, high-density residential, or urban land uses, however you want to characterize it. But you basically get down to, well, we all need to reduce 32% of our load to get to our final goal. So what that likely will mean is those that provide have more load have more work to do, and those that have provide less load have less work to do. But that may not work out for you. You may want to do something based on population. Maybe some jurisdictions are a little bit better suited to getting work done, and so maybe you might want to alter that that uh, that that waste load allocation to to allow some jurisdictions to uh, maybe have a little bit more leeway to get some projects done because of their circumstances. But uh, a good starting place is basically look at you know everybody reduces the same percent from each land use category to get to the total uh, to get to the total waste load allocation. And, and that seems to be a pretty easy way, a pretty uh, transparent way of doing it. But you're certainly welcome to, to look at other ways. It's just, you know, you, you eventually have to show that you're going to get to that waste load allocation. So the next part is what is the estimated current load discharged by the MS4 for the pollutant uh, identified in the TMDL? So the first thing is look at when was your TMDL written? If it was written really recently, uh, the current loads may be pretty close to what's in the document. But if it's much older, there could have been a lot of things that have occurred in the watershed uh, in the subsequent years. You could have had a lot of land use change. You could have had a lot of uh, BMPs getting installed, voluntary BMPs or, or non-voluntary BMPs. Um, you could have uh, how were the loads. And then you want to look at how the loads were calculated. The, the ones that we are familiar with, are the, certainly in the little j, it was used the, the GWLF model, uh, also some of what referred to as map sheds, which is basically the interface for the GWLF model. It's a GIS-based watershed um, tool, modeling tool. It uses hydrology, land cover, soils, topography, all that, kind of, uh, all that kind of great information to model sediment and nutrient transport within a watershed. So uh, that was the tool, that was the model that, that we were, or that, that was used to develop the little J TMDL. And I believe a lot of uh, TMDLs were developed using the GWLF model. So it's, it's likely that you have that. It may also be possible that it was based on monitoring data. And um, if you want to look at what your current loads are based on that, you may need to do follow-up monitoring if you suspect the load has changed significantly. Uh, Blair County did a great job of this. They had a metals TMDL on Beaver Dam Branch that they felt like, uh, you know, they maybe had some issues with. So they invested a lot of time and energy in going out and doing uh, monitoring. And they're coming back with a lot of results. I think they still have some work uh, to do, and it's certainly an investment in time and money. But it, in the long run, it, it may work out for you that that's something you want to do. But keep in mind that that's, it's definitely investment in time and money. So, you know, if you suspect a significant change, you may want to do that. If not, you, you may just want to go with what's, what's modeled or what's, what's in, the, in the document itself. Uh, but you'll have to decide, you know, based on what you think is, is most appropriate for your jurisdiction. I just want to provide a quick screenshot. This is just to give you a couple ideas of what the map sheds GWLF interface looks like. There's essentially a lot of fields where you can enter information, uh, like the amount of acre, uh, I think it's actually hectares, and, um, and you can provide, um, you know, there's a lot of fields you can modify and change. And this is how they essentially develop the TMDL. And then you can use the same tool to document how, or to, dem to document your current loads, and then also document how you're going to meet your waste load allocation. So just a quick screenshot of what it looks like. 
Uh, so current loads, um, you're going to start to calculate your current load. So just to come back to that impaired watershed boundary, this is where you're going to run into a lot of problems if you have mismatched boundaries. If the GIS boundary you have does not match the boundary in the document and the acres don't match, you're already going to have problems because the acres aren't going to match and because the acres don't match, the load's not going to match. And so hopefully earlier on in the process you were able to, if there was an issue, get with DEP and come up with a solution to that problem. Um, if you have had a lot of a development or, uh, or maybe even um, impervious surface removal, you may want to adjust the land use figures uh, to reflect what is currently on, on the ground uh, in your jurisdiction, especially if a significant amount of time has passed. And if possible, it would be great if you can update the BMP information in the model. Uh, this is, needs fairly detailed BMP data to do a good job of this. I mean, we're talking like you need to know basin volume, surface area, wet storage volume, dead storage volume for things like ponds, for things like bioretention or infiltration facilities, you need to know information like the amount of runoff retention and the fraction of the area treated that you know, is being uh, collected by your BMP. So it is a bit rigorous, but every bit of information you could pull together for BMPs that are on the ground that are not currently reflected in the model is going to help you in the long run demonstrate what your current loads actually are. If you don't have this information, I certainly encourage you over the long run to look at you know, developing a, a decent BMP inventory of what you have on the ground. This can help out in later, uh, later stages where you're really looking at what opportunities do we have. And then make sure you're getting the, not, the voluntary BMPs too, like stream restoration projects or buffer plantings that may be done by partner organizations, Isaac Walton Leagues, uh, the watershed groups, those types of people, if they have done projects, you'll want to know where, where they are and, and how much of, of each there are so you can, uh, you can show that in your model for, uh, and model your current loads based off of all that great work that people have been doing. So here's just a quick uh, snapshot again of the map sheds tool uh, and how BMPs get put in. So you can see again a lot of pretty detailed information in here. Um, if you can pull this together, very helpful, um, but if not, perhaps it's something to strive for in the future. But it can definitely help you uh, demonstrate or get a more accurate picture of what your current loads actually are. So again, I just wanted to hit back, you know, if we had these acres off and these acres off, we're going to have a hard time doing our loads because we're sort of all over the place in terms of, uh, in terms of acres and uh, what's in, what's out. We'd have double counting for CSO, so we needed to get that straightened out. And then you're going to need to dis dis explain how you came up with that. So take notes on your assumptions that were used. You know, provide, you know, keep track of your existing BMP data, any stream restoration information you had, the changes in land use. Again, keep in mind if you have impervious surface removal projects, if you're you know, taking down abandoned buildings or something like that, you, you'll want to address that as well. Um, if you did monitoring, you're going to have to provide what your monitoring procedures were, your dates, uh, what data you collected, that kind of information. Uh, and then the easiest thing to do is just to use the GDO, if they use the model to develop, um, uh, if to use the model to develop the TMDL, our suggestion is to use the same model to develop you know, your current loads. Models all calculate things differently, so you can really get yourself into a headache over trying to figure out why one model is predicting one thing and one's predicting another. So you come up with a table like this that has TMDL load um, at X pounds. That's what the TMDL says. Then you have your current load is Y uh, pounds, so maybe less, it may be more. Um, and then you'll have your reduction to meet the, um, or to achieve your waste load allocation. So now you'll, you essentially know this is what the TMDL says the start line is, this is what your current start line is, and here's your finish line. So now you'll, or how, this is how much you need to do to get to your finish line. So once we've sort of got a handle on our current loads, it's time to figure out how we, are we ever going to get down to that waste load allocation. And this is really where the rubber meets the road here is TMDL design detail number 10. So the first part is going to be to list 
all the control measures you're going to be put in place. You're going to have a location information, a timeline, how the pollutants reduced, the pollutant loading entering the BMP, the reduction in pollutants, the rationale for selecting the BMP, and description of inspection, operation, and maintenance procedures. So I'm going to go through this uh, pretty quickly here. So the easiest way is probably to pick TMDL, approved TMDL control measures. And it's going to be a lot easier to explain why you selected these when DEP is sort of saying, here are control measures we like to see. So pretty straightforward. Uh, riparian buffers, really good, cost-effective projects. Uh, disconnection program, maybe there's impervious areas that are connected to your MS4 that you could disconnect. Uh, tree planting, so this would be non-buffer tree planting, so this could be street trees or um, canopy projects, tree canopy projects, those types of things. Um, recharge or infiltration facilities. Uh, retrofitting stormwater basins is one of my favorites. Uh, restoring stream banks, which has definitely been a big one for most jurisdictions I've worked with in Pennsylvania, is really looking at um, stream restoration, although you want to make sure that you've got a handle on your upland hydrology before you run off <coughs> restoring streams. You don't want them to blow out <coughs> later on. Um, and then you can establish green infrastructure at facilities uh, owned by the MS4, so green roofs, bioretention facilities, all that wonderful stuff. Um, you can implement stricter stormwater ordinances uh, that really drive additional credits. And then if you have an approved training and offset program, you can participate in that. So for us, what we would like to do is let's look at what, you know, how do we identify which control measure are we looking at? And really, first thing you want to do is what's the pollutant of concern? And then you look at the, BM, the effectiveness of BMPs for that pollutant and choose it accordingly. So, you know, if, it's, uh, if you've got a sediment TMDL, you're going to want to look at BMPs that do a good job for sediment. If it's a nitrogen C TMDL, you're going to want to look at projects that do a good job for nitrogen. There may also be some design considerations you may put into the BMPs that get you higher levels. But keep in mind that if you're in a Chesapeake Bay community, you're going to need to get nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment as well anyway. So, you know, it, it kind of comes out in the wash. You kind of want to look at a lot of these different things at once especially if you're going to have to do the Chesapeake Bay Pollution Reduction Plan uh, on the back end. Uh, so, you know, keep track of, uh, of all, that, uh, all that information because it's going to come in handy when you do Part B. Uh, and then we, start with a, we like to start with a desktop and then do some field reconnaissance. So looking at your GIS layers, identify some of your pollutant hotspots. Um, really a good one is looking at your public properties, so municipal buildings, schools, parks, uh, things like road right-of-ways. Um, these are all areas where, you know, the municipality usually owns or has some level of control over the land and can, you know, pretty readily get a project in the ground. There's also existing stormwater basins, uh, especially older basins and dry ponds. These are great opportunities for upgrade. Uh, you, you, you may um, not necessarily own the ponds, but uh, definitely look at them because there's some really good opportunities there. Water is already going to these, so you can get a lot of acres treated and you can generally get some pretty good credit out of upgrading existing stormwater basins. A lot of jurisdictions throughout the watershed are using this strategy pretty heavily and certainly is one that I feel is, is, uh, is really very useful. So really look at those stormwater basins, see what you can do there to uh, increase their performance. Um, obviously, stream restoration opportunities, if you've got those, those stream assessments, uh, you, you're really looking good. Um, if not, you know, maybe at least start to get a handle on where some of the bigger problems are and, and, and maybe even consider trying to get some basic uh, stream uh, assessment work done so you can really target that work to where it's most appropriate. Institutional lands are always good, you know, big universities, uh, you know, pr private landholders, maybe big retirement homes, things like that, you know, those are good opportunities. And then, you know, kind of on the tail end, at least on our uh, work was kind of looking at private property. Certainly disconnection, downspout disconnection programs could be a, a good way to get at private property without really having to do a whole lot of, you know, design work and, and investment. You just kind of disconnect those and, you know, get those downspouts pointed towards, you know, turf or, or naturalized areas and, and keep them from going straight into your, your MS4. So uh, this is just a couple of, of things. So what we did was identify some high priority sites that we go out in the field and, and visit those. Um, we also like to, so once you sort of start to identify what are the sites or where can we go, you might want to target some BMPs. So 
again, this is kind of what we look at uh, as where we kind of think is bioswales. Are there roadside, uh, are there road ditches or tax ditches that could be converted into bioswales? You know, they're in the road right away. Uh, certainly state, some of the state highway agencies throughout the watershed have been doing a lot of this work. Uh, again, back to the retrofitting of existing practices, one of my favorites. Um, impervious cover that could be converted or removed into tree planting areas or landscape areas. You know, if there's impervious cover out there that's not um, useful, then, you know, getting that out of there is definitely a big one and, and a pretty cost-effective solution. Uh, are there outfalls that are blowing out uh, that are causing problems? You can use these regenerative stormwater conveyance mechanisms or step pool storm conveyances. Uh, there's sort of a new uh, technique, uh, but essentially is a basically a, sort of a deluxe bioswale, if you will. Uh, it's got some unique uh, features to it, including like uh, wood chips in the, in the mix and really does a great job at, uh, at reducing pollutants while conveying water. So those could be, those could be a, a good one. You got your stream restoration projects. Again, keep in mind, um, you should probably be looking at some upland retrofits in conjunction with that to really maximize the benefit of those. But, uh, but stream restoration projects certainly can get you, especially sediment, a lot of, a lot of benefit. And of course, riparian buffers, you know, what kind of stream miles you have that don't have buffers and what's feasible to plant there. Uh, very cost effective, uh, generally acceptable practice by most, uh, most citizens, but uh, uh, a good opportunity to get in there and get some good credit for just planting trees. You know, not a lot of permits or any permits required and pretty cost effective. Um, so the next thing is you're going to want to identify where that control measure is located in the pollutant load. So you can take a GPS coordinate or point while you're there on site taking a look at your area and or you can get lat long coordinates from uh, uh, GIS or, or your Google Earth if you don't have GIS. Uh, you can kind of get your arrow on there and it'll give you the lat long coordinates. Um, and then you're going to, the big thing is you're going to need to estimate the drainage area to the BMP location to calculate pollutant load. That's the big thing. I mean, with stream restoration, you can do linear feet, but, but to ponds and to, to bioretention facilities and to regenerative stormwater conveyances, you, you need to know how much is draining there to, to, um, to really get a good handle. So at a minimum, you want to know how much, how many acres are draining to it. Better still is acres and percent impervious. So if you know how much land there is and how much of that is impervious, that's great. And the best is if you know the acres, the percent impervious, and the exact land use in there, you can really calculate exactly, or much more exactly, within the context of the model, how much load is going to those BMPs. So here's an example of a BMP that we've looked at in, uh, in Blair County. The BMP is located down here in the corner. Let me get my arrow going. Where'd my arrow go, Chris? Here it is. Here's my arrow. So the BMP is down here. This red line is sort of an indication of our estimated drainage area. So we can calculate the load, pollutant load in there based off this land use and the acres too. So I'm going to go through that real quickly here. So here, here's uh, from our TMDL document. This provides the loading rate for a variety of land uses. So we can get the loading rates for that land use, and we know the acres, so we can start to determine the load. So, um, and then we have how the pollutant is reduced and the reduction associated with it. So most BMPs already have an approved efficiency for the most common pollutants like sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Pennsylvania has a BMP manual. It's currently being updated, so it may not be the best source because those numbers may change. Chesapeake Bay program has model documentation on all kinds of BMPs. Uh, it provides efficiencies for BMP, uh, for a variety of BMPs. There's also these Ches Chesapeake Bay expert panel reports, which sort of give you a, a sort of a look into the future as to where these efficiencies are coming from or what they might look like in the future. So certainly encourage you to maybe look at some of those expert panel reports to see how they're treating, uh, treating the, the load or the, the efficiencies of BMPs. And then you can always re rely on peer-reviewed studies for, um, for other projects, if you feel like there's an efficiency that's not accurate, if you can provide information to DEP on a peer-reviewed study that says it should be something else, then they will certainly take it under consideration. So here's an example of one way to do it. This is totally made up. Uh, so this is a bioretention at a high school. It's on sea soils with an underdrain is what we're proposing. Uh, this, the TSS efficiency 
for a bioretention on sea soils, this number is from the Bay program, it's 55%. So we're going to say, again, this is totally made up. So let's say it's uh, three quarters of an acre it drains to this practice. It's completely impervious, uh, and we have a land use loading rate of roughly 1,800 pounds, and that's the land use for urban impervious. Again, it's totally made up. So we multiply the acres times the loading rate to get our load to that BMP for sediment. So you can see here, three quarters of an acre times one point, or eight, roughly 1,800, gives us roughly 1,300, 1,361 pounds of, se of sediment to the BMP. BMP gives us 55% reduction credit. So if we treat that area fully, we get a 749 pound per year reduction efficiency. So you could also do the same thing within the context of the GWLF model. You can see it pre-populates with some existing BMPs, but there's also these other BMPs you can enter in data in here. You can enter efficiency information so it can calculate it for you uh, if you want to go that route. Uh, other BMPs to consider, street sweeping is a very tempting one. Keep in mind, you can get TSS sediment credit for that BMP, but you have to keep in mind if you've had your street sweeping program in, in around since before the TMDL was developed, you have to increase the amount of street sweeping you do over what you were doing before. So if you were sweeping up 400,000 pounds prior to the TMDL and you're sweeping up 500,000 pounds after the TMDL is credit done, you only get credit for that amount that you swept above and beyond what you were doing before the TMDL was developed. So keep that in mind. Um, if you want the nutrient credit, you got to sweep the streets, the same street, the same mile, two times a month or 25 times per year. People rarely get this type of amount done. And I just want to caution you that this number may change. I believe there's an expert panel looking at this right now. Uh, so you keep that in mind that, that some of these, they may look tempting, but uh, there's a little bit, you know, you kind of have to read between the lines. Urban nutrient management is another one. Uh, it's out there, not really fully developed yet in Pennsylvania. Really, we're looking at managing fertilizer applications to turf land. Uh, if you're going to start to look at this program, I definitely encourage you to look at, you know, your high-risk area like steep slopes, sandy soils, buffer areas, and intensive use areas like athletic fields and golf courses. But not fully cooked yet in terms of Pennsylvania, but uh, hopefully more to come there. Um, develop a spreadsheet for your database or develop, develop a database for these projects. So you're going to include your project name, your location, information, lat long, your project measures like acres treated, feed of stream bank restoration, acres of buffer, et cetera, and then your estimated pollutant reduction as a result of that project, and then a schedule of implementation to go with it. So um, I will just show you here real quick um, <clears throat> that here's an, just a quick example of what this might look like. You know, you can say here's a bioretention, and it's at Crosstown High School, provides some lat long coordinates. Here's your, we're doing acres treated with the bioretention, we're treating 1.22 acres. Here's our estimated load reduction as a result, and we think we can get this done in 2015. Yes, you know, stream restoration from 1,200 feet. Um, you know, we're getting pretty good reductions there. It's going to take us a little while to get these together, so we're not going to have that done until 2018. Just an example of, um, of you know, how you can time this out. I mean, thinking about, you know, permitting and what's going to take you a long time to get done. You know, pervious cover removal, you know, you might be, you know, converting um, land use from impervious to pervious, and then the change in land use is what you get the credit for. So that's reflected here, 200 pounds, and we're going to get that done you know, um, next, this, this coming year. So, uh, so some of this stuff is, you know, pretty straightforward um, in terms of, you know, how you would show this to DEP. Uh, what I encourage you in the appendix, this is where you'll address the inspection, operation, and maintenance of BMPs. Most standard BMPs, this information can easily be found in most stormwater manuals, uh, but there may also be some proprietary BMPs that you're considering using. Hopefully the vendor has some information for you on that that you can include. Um, if you're not, if you're including maybe some experimental or some sort of uh, uh, different BMP, uh, you may need to include some additional rationale for why you're picking that BMP. Uh, you know, this thing does a really good job in, in this particular circumstance. Uh, 
So you, you, can, you can think about that. I'm not sure exactly what you're going to be looking at, but you may need to include some additional thinking or rationale for why you're picking this BMP. I think most of the standard ones are pretty straightforward. There's approved efficiencies for these pollutants, and you know, they're relatively cost effective. So that's why, we're, you know, that's why most people do them. So that was a real quick. I've got about five minutes left for Q&A. I think there's a couple of pre questions up here. A couple of questions. A few people asking questions about the uh, MapSheds program. Yeah. Like, is it free and where can I get it? Absolutely. MapSheds is free. It's a program that Penn State developed. Uh, I will provide in the resources sheet a, um, a link to get to, uh, to get to it. A quick Google search, I think you'll land on it. Uh, it's a P, it's, again, it's a Penn State product. I believe uh, they are updating it and making it a little bit more uh, flexible and, and uh, robust for, for inputting a variety of BMPs. So I, you know, keep an eye out for that. There should be uh, something coming, but uh, it is available um, online. You can download it. Um, we certainly got it for free, no, no problem there. Uh, but keep an eye out for updates here in the near future. Uh, what else do we have? I had a question about street sweeping and uh, what do you do with the sweepings themselves? Do they have to be disposed in the landfill? Bill Frost weighed in and let you know that yes, they should go to a landfill. I don't know if you have any. Yeah, no, to that. that's exactly correct. Uh, you got to take the you got to take the the, the, the material to a landfill and dispose of it properly. Uh, again, just want to. Caution you got uh, everyone on street sweeping. I know there's some expert panels looking at that now. So that may be a little uh, dynamic uh, in terms of what the credit's going to be here in the near future. But, but yeah, you, you do need to dispose of that uh, material um, properly and, and, and get it away. You can't pick it up and then go and spread it out somewhere else in the watershed. Uh, that, uh, that doesn't really... Uh, get us to where we need to be. So we want to get that stuff up and out of the street before it can get down into the into the system and, and into the streams uh, and taken care of properly. Let's see. Are there any other questions? I did see there was one question here about. Just had one come in. On um, more note about switch street sweeping, uh, according to uh, the Pennsylvania DEP, um, Paul wrote Those in there used. to let us know it can be used as pipe bedding. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense, Paul. Um, that, that, that's, that sounds um, reasonable. I think as long as you're getting it up out of somewhere where it can basically get washed back into, um, you know, back into the pipe system, uh, you'll want get to get rid of that. Some of that material, depending on, uh, uh, you know, what you're picking up, may include a lot of debris and trash. Uh, so you'll want to think about that. Also, um, if you do have a street sweeping program, uh, keep in mind things like leaf litter. Leaf litter can be a huge source of, uh, of uh, nutrients. So getting that leaf litter up and out of there and disposed of properly beyond just the fines, which uh, I'm sure, Paul, you don't want to use leaf litter as your pipe bedding. So if you're getting a lot of leaf litter and a lot of, uh, you know, debris like that, you'll want to dispose of that stuff properly. You know, if it's not suitable material for use, that's not going to risk, you know, getting input back into the system. Um, you know, that, that obviously is what we're trying to do is get that stuff up and out of the street, out of the gutter pan, or out of the catch basin uh, before it has a chance to make its way through the MS4 system and into the stream. Uh, let's see. Time for one more question here. What was your source for TSS load reduction efficiencies for stream restoration? So there's a couple different places you can get stream uh, TSS load reduction efficiencies. We've done this a couple different ways. Uh, one is you can use the Chesapeake Bay model reduction rate. Uh, that's one. Um, you can get that, uh, I believe it's something like 56 pounds per linear foot. It's relatively low. Um, in the case of York County, what they did down there is they did some monitoring uh, pre-construction uh, and post-construction, so they were able to come up with a load reduction efficient, well, actually it's pre-construction. Uh, they had some design work going forward, so they were able to come up with a more a uh, precise estimate for those individual projects, that's ideal because you'll get w pro likely way more credit that way than you will just taking some model efficiency. You can also use literature review values if there's been projects in your watershed that are similar in type to the type of project you're doing, 
say it's a floodplain reconnection project and you're doing floodplain reconnection. And it's in, and it's a project that's in Pennsylvania, and they have data that goes with it. You can cite that work and, and use that efficiency, uh, but you'll need to provide where you're getting that information to DEP uh, so that they can go back and check, make sure everything's okay. So, but the best is if you have some information that's site specific with regard to your project, that's really how you're going to um, really boost that number because uh, you'll have specific information related to, okay, our banks are this big and this is how much load is coming off of them and our project will, you know, reduce it by X amount. So uh, let's see, what else do we have here? There's one more on, are there TMDL monitoring requirements once a plan is implemented? That is a uh, good question. I am not sure is, I'm not sure, do we have any DEP folks on that want to maybe hop on the chat box and answer that question? I don't want to be out of place here. I know certainly for the case of uh, in Blair County, uh, those guys uh, with regard to the Beaver Dam branch, they're doing their own monitoring up there uh, and they're, you know, looking at uh, specifically metals. So they're they're investing in monitoring there, so that's more, they're, they're sort of monitoring overall loading in that stream, so it's not really, uh, uh, once the plan is implemented, they sort of have a, a thought as to what, um, you know, what, what the load uh, should be, and they're trying to back that up with, with data, but uh, Chris, uh, I'm not sure, um, I don't believe there are any significant monitoring requirements but, uh, you know, it's, I think, uh, I think, you know, so many of these plans are probably going to take quite a while to get fully implemented. It's not like you're going to get this done overnight in, in most uh, cases. So maybe several years uh, or maybe several permit cycles before you get them uh, all in place. So I think, you know, I, I think I'm safe in saying that I think what DEP is really focused on and certainly what we uh, are pushing forward as well is um, is you know get some projects in the ground and 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 we you know move forward uh, with trying to get implementation done and and we can worry about monitoring the results uh, of the overall impact of those projects down the line. But <clears throat> right now, I think the focus is on w what are the control measures and how do we how do we get those in place. So it looks like we are out of time. Just wanted to have one last thing. Please mark your calendars. Part two of this webcast is coming up next week, June 10th at 12 o'clock, same bat channel, same bat time. So this one is going to focus on part B. That's the Chesapeake Bay Pollution Reduction Plans for MS4s. So we will, um, we, will come, we will come equipped with some more information for you guys with regard to pulling together part B of, uh, of, the, of that document I highlighted earlier and really focusing on that Chesapeake Bay Pollution Reduction Plan. So if you haven't already, I hope, hope you uh, uh, register and you can join us uh, next week. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. Just want to again thank the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for their sponsorship of this webcast and all the great work up in Pennsylvania. And I sh look forward to uh, continuing to work up in Pennsylvania with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and hopefully many of you all. And if we did not get to your question today, uh, and you have something you'd like to contact me offline, feel free to contact me. My web address or my email is on the prior slides, BTS, B as in boy, T as in Tom, S as in Sam, at cwp.org. Send me an email, and I will do my best to help you out. Again, thank you very much, and I hope you all have a great afternoon.